Hello there and a huge, warm, lovely welcome to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. I'm delighted to be back with you again. I hope you're happy to be here. I hope you're excited because today we're talking about creativity. What better topic could there be? Well, actually, fun is an even better topic. That's the next one, but creativity is a pretty good topic. We're going to be covering everything to do with te teaching creatively, bring creativity into your piano studio. So what it means to be a creative teacher and the creative skills and how we can make other things more creative. The things that we don't normally think of maybe as being creative. And we're going to go through some other fun stuff as well. So I'm so excited. Let's get started. <laughs> Hey, howdy and hello. It is so great to be starting off this discussion about creativity and we've already got some great comments coming in. Thank you, you, thank of you. Thank you to those of you who are live right now and have added in your thoughts about what it means to be a creative teacher. If you haven't, add them in now. Let me know. Let me know that you're watching. Say hello to us and tell me what you think it means to be a creative teacher. We had a great comment there from Clara Viola. Being a creative teacher means using a variety of ways, games, hands-on activities to engage students in the learning process and immerse them in making music, I'm guessing is the end of that sentence. That's a beautiful statement. And then as Cindy said, learning new things, trying new things and growing myself as a musician. You know what I love about these um, definitions guys how broad they are I love that straight away we're going into creativity means basically everything right not oh well it means doing a bit of improv it means teaching the blues it's so much broader than that and that's exactly what we're about to explore today it means connection learning it's very special I love that thank you for that comment oh my gosh you guys are awesome uh, let me see here. There's another good one that I saw going past. Joanna, I want to be more creative in my business. Find new places to do recitals, new ways to market. Yes, bring creativity into business. That's fantastic, Joanna. Thank you for that. And Juliet just simply says to think outside the box. It's a great way to look at it. So tell me what it means to you. And if you're new... Hi, if you haven't joined us before, hello. My name's Nicola Canton, if we haven't met yet, elsewhere. And I run a blog called Colourful Keys and a membership community called Vibrant Music Teaching. And these chats are our weekly way to check in with each other and have a community together. Have a community experience. Discuss a topic, yes, but really it's about connection. That's what it's all about here on the YouTube channel, on these YouTube live chats. So connect, say hi, don't lurk, don't hide away. We're a very friendly community. I would say the friendliest community of piano teachers online and we would love to hear from you. So if you are new, please say hello to us and let us know that it's your first time watching because we'd love to hear from you. And if you've been here a bajillion times, if you've been on every single one of these live chats, if you have been on every one, I would be impressed because we were doing three a week. So I doubt there's anyone who's been on all, quite every single one, but I know a few of you have made pretty, pretty close to all of them. So if you're a regular, make sure to welcome the newbies and um, I'm delighted to have you back as well. So creativity, what does it mean to me? Well, as we've already hit upon, it's much broader than people often think. So to me, Anything can be creative and everything should be creative. But creative assignments, the things we often refer to as creativity, i.e. improvisation, composition, and maybe arrangements, which we will discuss in a second, those things can be uncreative. They can be, if we make them so. So composing is not creative if we teach it in a very regimented way and if we won't follow the students' whims when they need to be followed. Improvisation can be 
uncreative as well if the student is not inspired by it. And traditional stuff, on the other hand, the reading, the Beethoven, the Bach, that can be creative. All of it can, if you approach it in the right way, especially using questions. And that's something we'll get to at the end of this discussion. Let's start with improv, though. How many of you in the comments are new to improv? How many of you have never improvised before or maybe have just started improvising this year? I'd love to hear from you. Um, and welcome to Jennifer, newbie to the chats here. That's awesome. <laughs> Carrie said, welcome to the newbies. Carrie is absolutely a regular here. It's great to have you back again, Carrie. I always notice you because of the ears. <laughs> they jump out to me straight away. Carrie, you, you struggle with teaching improv. Okay. Awesome. It's an area for improvement, right? We all have an area where we can get better and we can learn more. And I mean, we can all learn more in every area, but we all have some that are easier for us and some that are harder. And for a lot of people, one that is harder is improvisation. So I want to say straight off the bat, straight away, that you don't have to be some improv master to include it in your lessons. I don't suggest that you call yourself an improvisation teacher um, or a jazz teacher if you don't know what you're doing, but you don't have to be an improvisation teacher to use improv to teach. That's the distinction I often make. That's what I do. I use improvisation to teach and it allows my teaching to be more creative without me being some improv specialist. Some people might see me as that if they just had a cursory glance at the blog, but that's really not what I am. I'm not an incredible improviser myself. I wouldn't impress you. <laughs> and that should be comforting to you. I hope that it is because if I can improvise with all my students, you one bajillion percent can too because they're still behind you and you can use it to teach so what do i mean by using improv to teach some of you will um, be familiar with the circle of fifths odyssey which is a course inside vmt which by the way so many people have used the term vmt in the chat already which is great but in case anyone is brand new to us here that stands for Vibrant Music Teaching, which is the membership site. So that's why they're saying VMT, VMT. Um, but inside VMT, there is this course. It's called the Circle of Fifths Odyssey. And if you're a member and you're unsure about improv, you're new to it, and you really, it's one of your goals this year, right? It's really something you want to do. Start there. Start with the Circle of Fifths Odyssey. It's going to be a great way to really... Um, plunge your feet in, right? Not just dip a toe in, but plunge in. And that might sound scary and it, yeah, it will be a little bit, but it's nothing you can't handle. There's nothing complex in there at all. The only thing that's holding you back from doing that is not your skills, it's your apprehension of doing it and just trying it with your students. I actually remember the first time I improvised with a student in a lesson. It was an adult student and I was petrified. I mean, I was so scared. This was about, oh my gosh, that's, that's terrible. It might be even almost 10 years ago now, or maybe eight. See, I haven't been at this as long, that long. You can do this too. But back then, I'd been teaching for quite a few years, but I wasn't an improviser and I'd never really done it with my students. And I'd seen this thing online about teaching with, improv and doing it with beginners especially I was like I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it but like my stomach was solid butterflies it was just fluttering around and I was telling myself not to let that show up on my face because at the same time I'm this young teacher with this older not older but older than me adult student and but I did it and you know what it was all right it wasn't amazing, we didn't do the best improvisation there has ever been, but my my adult student got a little buzz out of it and I didn't fall flat on my face. It was grand, it was fine. And so if you just give it a go, you will get over that. And yet the first few times those butterflies will still be there, 
But if you do something like the Circle of Fifth's Odyssey, that's a 12-week program. And if you go the whole way through it, you're going to get more comfortable with it. You're going to get used to it. The other tip I have for the newbies is just to practice your accompaniment part. If you're going to do an improvised duet, practice your accompaniment part. If you're going to do something where you need to demonstrate a bit of improv, work out some little riffs in advance. That's not cheating. It's still improv. That's actually what improvisers are doing a lot of the time. They have default riffs that they're going through. They're not actually doing it all from scratch, right? Carrie said, I've learned the lesson when trying something new as well. Start small. Only with one or two students to begin. That's great. I tend to jump in with both feet and that has gotten me into some trouble. Okay, so you can go one way or the other. I'm someone who would be more likely to dip the toe. And so I kind of have to push myself to jump a bit further. But we all need to aim for, you know, getting up to our calves wet. So if you're someone who jumps into the deep end and starts flailing, you need to edge back a bit. If you're someone who does dip the toe in the water and then gradually ease themselves in, Maybe you need to jump into that calf height water. <laughs> Dina, yeah, the circle of fifths, right? It was left out of so many of our educations, <laughs> our upbringings. It's just bizarre. And it's such a useful tool and so instinctive. And yeah, it's incredible. Faye, yes, Bradley Sawash is awesome. Love his work. Very much recommend him. If you want to get into like a class program and really get good at improv yourself, I think Bradley's courses would be a great way to do go. He does group classes, so they're more like you're a student. I mean, it's more, it, a lot of teachers do it, but it's not so much teacher training as you are a student of improv. And he does different themes and stuff. And also, he's just a really cool guy. I like Bradley a lot. Um known for a little while now and I think he's great and he's really passionate about spreading this stuff to teachers so definitely check out his stuff if you haven't already and he has great books as well that you can use with students we use them sometimes in my studio so that's improv now let's talk about composition by the way this series we're we're actually skimming the water if we want to consider the water analogy a bit further if it's not getting too painful for you guys we're just skimming the top of the water of a whole bunch of topics so this is our second last week of this we're talking about creativity today but we're really trying to get a broad view of all of these things and what it means to be a teacher that is creative in this case so if you want more in-depth stuff on improv we definitely have that and we definitely have tons of resources inside vmt for that this is a, a surface skim of the water to get a sense of um Everything that means creativity to to us teachers. So let's talk about composition with that in mind. That's the next area that often comes to people's minds. Are you teaching composing in your studio? Are you scared to do it? Have you done it a little bit but it didn't work for some reason or another? Let me know in the comments and I'll try to help you out. I have two types of comp composing that I really do in my studio. And one I'm very good about consistently doing, and one I'm not so good, but I keep trying to get better, and that's something I'm striving for. So let's start on the positive. Let's start with the one I'm good at. The thing I'm good at is the big composing project that we do every year. We do that from around March to May-ish. I mean, really a lot of the students finish by the end of April, but, you know, there's a bit of leeway in there. So we're really wrapping that up mid-May every year. So two two and a half months that sounds like a lot but it's only a few minutes out of each lesson for the student and that's the best way for us to manage that so that is a big project where every student composes a full piece it's uh normally 16 bars right they're mostly beginners so if they're further along they might do a bigger piece but in general they're composing a simple piece 16 bars 16 measures in um a simple form so a b b a or a b a b there's a, a basic format that we follow every year and within that format they can be extremely creative but we follow that structure so that it is manageable and they can take it in chunks and we can go through the process and really work on it with them so those that process is detailed in all the composing projects they all follow the same similar format um, and you can find them all in the library or on the blog 
Then last year we did the collaborative composition project. And so that one, do I have the book? Oh, I do, look. Let's see if we can get it out from under here. We're only gonna drop a few things, here we go. Okay, this is the book we created this year. And you'll see some of the pieces inside. So that's kind of what it looks like. So we put all of the pieces together every year in a book like this. This year was extra special because we did collaborative compositions. So every piece was worked on by four students at least, or sometimes up to six students worked on the same piece until it was finished. And then we put them all together in this book. Claire, you did the composing project in the summer. That's awesome. Therese, I think the next idea is going to be for you and anyone else who's struggling with time. Like I say, this is a commitment. It's it's two, two and a half months of about five minutes out of each lesson. But I think it's worth it. One of the things I love about teaching composing is not just the creative aspect. It is also the theory that they're learning. So they're notating it themselves and they're learning about note stem rules and key signatures and time signatures and transposing rhythms. All of transposing rhythms what do I mean writing down their rhythms anyway transcribing rhythms that's what I meant to say and yeah all of that stuff and so it really is worth it to us in terms of the theory value as well as the creativity but you have to balance all of these things out hmm that's interestingly did you walk through it in the lesson or did you try to get them to do it in practice that would be my follow-up question because really it doesn't work to get students to do this at home because it is too hard it's just too hard and if you go through it with them in the lesson this is for everyone so not just Lee if you go through it with them in the lesson you will see how hard it actually is and that's kind of part of the value of it is you're going to go through it and realize oh my gosh it is so much for them to just write down a few notes but obviously they learn so much through that. And if you're walking them through, through it in the lesson, it doesn't feel that hard for them. But they really do need a good bit of babysitting, especially for the first, first project, first two projects they do, as in the first two years in the studio, they need a lot of hand-holding through that process. And then uh, they get better at it over time. Thank you, Carrie. Carrie just commented on my mug, so let me show you all. It is a Henry. Does anyone know? Let's get him to focus. Does anyone know this Hoover? I think it's a UK thing, like obviously in Ireland as well, but I don't know if you have the Henry Hoover in the US, but it's an inside joke with a friend of mine, so she got me the cup. Um, Yeah, so that's my big composing project. The thing that I said I'm looking to get better at and might be more useful for Teresa is micro compositions. So I've done a bit of this and I'm doing it more, but I still want to get better and better at this. And this is giving students those little assignments that they, uh, that they tackle partially with you, partially at home, but they're just tiny little projects, tiny little assignments. So they'd be like a four bar melody that they need to compose. And it's based on something you were working on. So it's getting creative with a concept they just learned. For example, they just learned the G major scale, they compose four bars, treble clef only, using the notes from the G major scale. See what I mean? So it's a micro composition, it's tiny, and it's not meant to be something that goes in a book, right? It's not meant to be something really polished and epic. It doesn't even have to have dynamics. It could be if that's something you're learning about, but it's just a quick and easy composing assignment. And that's something I need to do more of, I want to do more of. But it's one of those things, you know, you have to fit everything in, but it is one of my priorities for this year to make that a bit more regular, especially with the slightly further along students. I really think they can benefit from it so much and keeping, you know, a notebook or a few uh, manuscript pages in their folder of these tiny compositions so that they can get a bit more independence with it for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Just reading through you guys' comments here. Eloise, hi, great to see you. Um, I'm very new to improv teaching. Vibrant music teaching has helped me a lot in planning and trying out different improv activities. My students love it. That's great to hear, Eloise. I'm so glad it's helping you. 
just keep it up, keep going. So that's improv and composing. Those are the two defaults people always go to. Let's look at arranging next. So for this, I'm going to recommend a few resources because we're not going to have time to go through in detail, obviously, any of this stuff today. But arranging really the best, it doesn't have to be lead sheet based, but for me, that's where it's the most manageable for your studio and it gives you a great foundation for doing some arrangement work, combining the two together. So I do arranging with my students mostly when they're working on lead sheets. We have two, um, sorry, one so far, great course inside the library called Lead Sheet Kickoff. Lead Sheet Level Up is coming out later this year. Um, and that's basically level one and level two of lead sheet work. Lead sheet kickoff that's already there. That will be for students who have worked on lead sheets for several years. Like it's going to take a little while until they get really good at that level of work because it has several levels within it. Hope that makes sense. And then lead sheet level up is going to be the next steps, right? It's, it's really the rocket launcher. So with that lead sheet work, you're not necessarily officially creating an arrangement, right? You can get creative with that each week. But often we do um, end up coming up with a version that they're happy with and that they practice and learn how to play. And I think that's great, a great way for them to get proficient with lead sheet playing. Yes, it's not on the spot arranging, but it's, yeah. It's a great way to explore lead sheets and get comfortable with them and get pieces that they're happy to play, right? So if they learn Let It Be from a lead sheet and they try it a few different ways and then eventually they come to one that they like playing it that way, great. I think settle into that way. It's their arrangement. You can even get them to notate it or not or just have them memorize it. And it's a great way to bring those two things together, lead sheets and arranging. So we've got those courses inside the library. What we, what I'd also recommend to you though, especially for students who really want to get into this. So we have a few students who've come to Colourful Keys because they know, they know we do things a bit differently and that we're open to creative stuff. And really what they want to do is play in bands or accompany themselves. And maybe they have a bit of uh, sheet music, a bit of music reading already, maybe they don't, but that's really where they want to go. These are adult students and we're not going to stand in the way and say, no, you must read John Thompson. So <laughs> we generally with them will do most of our work through Forrest Kinney's fabulous, wonderful books called Puzzle Play. And that gives an amazing foundation, much more comprehensive than our lead sheet stuff. So the lead sheet courses in, in VMT are a great place to start and a great option for those teachers who want to include a bit of lead sheets in their year, right? A unit on it. Whereas if you have a student who really wants to dive deep on this, I would suggest Forrest Kinney's work over ours, for sure. Um, so those are called Puzzle Play from the wonderful Forrest Kinney. Uh, someone asked, yeah, Bradley's last name. Kelly is right, it is so wash. So, so wash. So wash your hands. Topical. Bradley, so wash. Right, so that's arranging. So, improv composition arranging. What about the thing I hinted at earlier? What about the traditional stuff we're doing? How can we make that creative? Because it can be. We don't have to section off our creativity. Like we're like so many people were saying earlier, creativity is such a broad topic and it can go across everything. But we have to intentionally try to make things creative. It won't just happen by magic. So how do we make everything creative? I think the simplest hack here, if we want an easy way into it, um, if this stuff is new to you, if you just want a way to get better at it, try to incorporate one open question every week. Questions that spark creativity with reading work. An example would be, what would you, what would happen if, blah, 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 right? So what would happen if we swapped all the dynamics? That is a creative act. What would happen if an elephant were to play this piece? What would happen if, oh, let me see, think of something more advanced. If instead of this, 
uh, piece being from the classical period, what would happen if someone wrote this today? How would it sound different? Right? Wouldn't necessarily, but you know, like what different accompaniment style would it have? That kind of thing. So that's a great starter. Another great one, if you're already using that one, try what do you think they? So what do you think they meant by doing it this way? What do you think they thought about doing but didn't do in this section? See what I mean? Those two questions can get you super far. And you can come up with different ones. Just But having those stock phrases, those stock starts to your questions, I think is a great in with making reading music more creative. And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be everything you do. Just little touches. Just one of those questions each week will make a massive difference to how your student thinks about written music. Okay, are we ready to get more creative? What we're going to do today as well is we're going to go through our new plans for VMT members called Online from the Outset. So we just released these two days ago. <laughs> uh, we just released these two days ago and they are a great kickstart for online lessons to get your students started when they're brand new or transfer students. I think this would be great for transfers as well. When we're stuck online or when we want to be online, if it's your choice. Or when we're socially distant. So it's not actually just about... We called it online from the outside because that's really where people are struggling the most. But I'm honestly going to be using this format and the teachers at our studio are for the first four weeks with any new student or any transfer student who's coming into us this September in, in our in-person lessons as well. Because here's the thing. A lot of the same considerations are true even if we're in a room right now. Because we can't, we can't play duets, we're, well we're not playing duets, we're choosing not to keep socially distanced. So we can't sit beside the student and play an improvised duet. We can't pick up their hands, right? We can't do a lot of the things we're normally doing. And these plans are going to work great for that situation as well. So I'm going to show you a little bit about them, show you what it looks like inside the site and the plan what the plans look like so you can get a sense of them. And if you have any questions about them, just let me know. I'm really excited about them because they have so much opportunity for creativity. So everything is included within them, by the way. So this is, you wouldn't be starting a method book with your student during these four weeks. And it also gives you a chance to get to know them, build that relationship and have some creative experiences together to get things off on the right foot when everything's a bit tense, to be honest. Relationships are going to be even harder to build right now and they are even more vitally important to us and our students. So let's take a look inside, shall we? Okay, so this is the VMT library. If anyone has not been here before, welcome inside. This is the printable library. It's what we call the printable library, although a lot of the Games and stuff right now also have on-screen versions, but it's um, resources as opposed to videos, right? We split those up. So this is online from the outside. Members can find it right at the top of the library right now. It's a six one down. And this is a bit of info about uh, the plans. I'm just going to open up the actual PDF though. So this is what it looks like. It starts with some recommendations for interview or first meeting lessons online because I know that was a consideration for many people so if you like me like to do a meeting with your students before they start with the parents as well um, to get to know each other to establish all these protocols and stuff this is advice for doing that online and some suggestions for questions and then we have an overview of the plans and some information about it and then we have the actual plans so this is what they look like they're very simple but that's the whole point it's about dot points, bullet points, so that you can get straight to um, what you need to do, right? And know where you are as a teacher and what you need to do so that you can just get going, just get to it. We're all busy, right? So every week we start with a one minute warm up. These are one of our new resources. So I'll give you a bit more info on those in a second because we have more info on the other page. It starts with a one minute warm up one minute warm up and then we go to some work on the rope piece 
And I've specifically um, laid this out so that even if you've never done rote teaching before, it's going to be super manageable. Because really the key to rote teaching is repetition split up throughout the lesson. That's what I think a lot of people miss when it comes to teaching by rote. So it's built in to work on it that way. So there's sort of a preview of the rote piece and some element of it and I'm helping you split all that up. So we do a rote piece which are written especially for online lessons to, and they're designed to get students comfortable with the keys. So they're all about navigating the piano but they're obviously also great and fun pieces to play. And then we have a theory game that you can play online or on a screen in the same room if you like and then more rote uh, piece work and then the oral game which is always this versus that in some fun way and then we have an improv that is an independent improv that they don't need to be playing a duet with you to do more rote piece work yes trust me it is necessary and then a recap of the lesson and suggestions for what they can practice at home so that's the basic format that we follow I'm gonna go click through Oh, you know what I meant to do and I didn't? Was open up these videos separately, but I think we'll be all right watching it here. You know what we want because I've muted YouTube, yeah. Um, so let's not worry about that, but the Reminder videos are all on YouTube here so that students can watch them in between lessons if they need So there's a full performance of them and then there's uh, details where I'm talking them through the piece Right, so a full demo So if they need that in between lessons as an extra reminder, they have it They also have listening tracks of all the pieces so that they can listen to them at home, right? So it makes it super easy for you. These pieces, these uh, plans are also designed to be to be flexible, of course, because your student is not necessarily going to go at the same pace as another student. So they're designed to be sort of fast so that you have enough material. But if you end up repeating basically the same as the first week for the first four weeks, that is fine. That is totally fine as long as you and your student are having fun and getting to know each other. Because that's really what the first month with a new student is about. Like I said, I would use these even with transfer students because there's nothing in them that says you have to be a beginner and it's going to give you that insight into whether they really know the piano keys whether they're comfortable being creative whether they can navigate well whether they have a good sense of beat and pulse all of those things so those are the plans let me show you though the games while we're here and you guys can let me know if you need any questions answered Annika had a question there would this be useful for students who are not new students nor transfer students? Meaning your own students who are continuing? Yeah, if you think they need a bit of a refresh, for sure. But if you your students are ticking along fine online, then I would just continue what you're doing with them already. But if you do need a bit of a reset, I think it could be a great break from normality, for sure, Annika. So what we did alongside releasing these plans was we released all the five new games. If members haven't seen this yet, by the way, here they are. And this, if you've been a member for a while, you'll know this is outside our regular rhythm. We normally release five new resources for members on the first of the month, every month. But I got a bit ahead of the game for September because I know how much people need the resources now. Because they need to get ready. And you know, we're just in a bit of a time desert and maybe a bit of a resource desert at the moment uh, as teachers. So I wanted to get this stuff out there and make sure people had it in time to get ready uh, for September because a lot of us start back in September and some of you have already started back. So you need it right now, right now, right now, right? <laughs> so that's why I put out the resources early this month and I hope that's useful for members. Um, we released, I won't open them all up uh, because otherwise we'll run out of time for web reviews but we released Sulfa Stack which is a Sulfa matching game that one's really fun we released Doggy and Froggy which is a version of Dogs and Frogs for again, long time followers will be familiar with those this is a version that works online but it's also great for reinforcing extra reinforcement for Dogs and Frogs for those that need it then Perfect Presence, which is about piano keys, so again, great for newbies. 
time tracks, which is for students who are a little bit further along, but the online version is extra fun because I made them turn a corner, which I think they'll get a giggle out of. And then one minute warm-ups, which are my... I was going to say passion project, that gives them the wrong slant, but there's something I'm really passionate about releasing because... I think we need to all get into our bodies a bit more in lessons. I think we need to acknowledge, some of you may be doing this, but I know it's been a weakness for me in acknowledging how physical the thing we're doing is, right? If we were doing tennis drills, we wouldn't, tennis coaches don't launch right into the drills. They do stretches and we never, we don't do them enough as pianists. So that's what I want to get into the habit of doing and that's why I put together these one minute warm ups. So there's eight of them. They come with videos. So again, if you are teaching online, you can open up this page and go full screen with this video and that's going to be clearer if you can't get up and show them the full demo of the action, right? So you can both follow the video. I think that's going to be a handy option through screen share or you can be doing this in person. You can also send, um, yeah. You can also send the info for them to be doing this at home or just reminders about how to do it at home as well. So there are eight of these. They're all fishy themed just for fun. And I've, yeah, they were interesting to record. Some funny movements in there. I would highly, highly recommend that you do these yourself too. Don't just get your students to do them even if you're teaching online. And if you feel a bit silly, grand, I understand. Like, if you look at the videos, you'll see that I have no problem um, looking like a bit of an idiot, as we would say in Ireland, <laughs> on a camera. But if you don't want to do that, I get it. Just turn off your camera for a sec, right? Put the screen share on with the video and ask your student to follow along with it. And you can be watching them, but you can turn off your camera, but still do them. Do the stretches. We need to get up and stretch so much more than we do. Um, this is why we have back pain. It's why we're in so much trouble. So if you can, if you obviously, some people this won't be accessible, but if it is accessible to you, do them along with your students. So that's the one minute warm ups, which we start every um, lesson of the online from the outset plans with. It's gonna come back on to say hi to you all. We have to do our web reviews as well, so we're going to do that in a second. But let me know if you have any questions about those resources, about anything. Um, Cindy, you're incredibly welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the support. Thank you to Juliet and <laughs> Carrie for the squeal. I really appreciate it. And Kelly, yeah, did you miss the email? It went out yesterday, as usual, the Sunday email. Um, I started it off by saying, the first is early. And then I realized I might have scared everyone. So I did explain myself um, because I almost scared myself saying if it was actually the first of September today, my head would explode straight off my shoulders. Like I still have so much to do. I'm getting there. But if it was the first today, I would be imploding. So. Beth, I'm so glad you had fun exploring it. Can you share how you play Doggy Froggy online with students? Yeah, there is a video for that. So I'm pretty sure it's included. Let me double check that for you, Beth, while we're here. But I think it's on the page there. Um, ah, no, it's not. I'm going to put that video on the page for you, which shows how I do this with another game, but it's a tutorial of how to do this with games in general. Uh, we play it outside of presentation mode, so you just need to know the format and then it'll all make sense to you. I'm going to put that video on the on the game page for you after we're done here, though, Beth. So, any other questions, just let me know. <laughs> yes, too many emails. We always have too many emails, and especially right now, yes? Uh, oh, Jennifer, you're welcome. It is a pleasure. I love hanging out with you guys and creating this community because, as someone I think said earlier, it's the most fun place to hang out online, or they, they said some paraphrase of that, and I agree, I always say that, because it's true! 
It's my favourite place. Like, I hang out at a lot of different places, right? I go into forums and Facebook groups and all this stuff. I do. Everyone else's as well. And it's not just because it's mine. But <laughs> I log into VMT and there's always someone with this warm bubbliness of loveliness. It's just awesome. Love VMT teachers. Okay. Are you ready to see some more VMT teachers? I think these two might be members. We have two websites to review as always, so if you haven't joined us before, this is one of the things we do here on the chat uh, every week, which by the way is always at this time every Monday, so make sure to subscribe if you want to join us live next time as well. So the web reviews are a chance for us to look at uh, teachers' websites, see what we can learn from what they're doing well, and give them sort of advice on what to do better. So we're going to dive into those now. And we are starting with Kimberly's Piano Studio today. So here we go, Kimberly's Piano Studio. So what do we like about it? There was actually some animation when I first loaded this. I haven't looked beyond that, but this was animated. I think it looked pretty slick when it loaded, so that was great. I like that there's a button here. I like that it has the hover effect on. I don't like the wording. It sounds nice. And as a teacher, I totally understand why you wrote it. Start learning. It sounds so positive. It sounds great. It's not strong enough, though. I think it should be something stronger. Like, what does it mean to start learning? I'm not really sure if I'm a parent, right? I don't really know what it means to start learning. I mean, I do. But, you know, I don't know what's going to happen when I click this button, is what I'm saying. And we need to make it clearer. So, make the button bigger, first of all, please, Kimberly. And then second of all, it should say book a lesson or whatever is relevant. Just something a bit stronger there. But I like that it's there. I like the photo too. Carrie said she liked the pic. I think it's fun. Then we've got some information about different music programs. Oh, great. Love these testimonials. Oh, I love that they're in students' voices. This is awesome. And I love that you've put it on the homepage. Everyone can learn so much from this. These are great. If you can get students to do things like that, that's great. Well done, Kimberly. Um, I would put a bit more text on this page, but otherwise I think it's great. I would just change that button. That's my only real recommendation there. Now, let's see where it does go. Oh, yeah, no, it does stay somewhere. Uh, okay, I would just standardize these fonts a bit because I've already seen quite a few, I think, or at least a few different sizes. So I'd standardize them. Also looked like this image is on the end of that text rather than being underneath and centered where it probably you intended to put it. So I'd just move that. Um, good, okay, so it goes to the contact page, so it is book a lesson. That is probably your, your call to action, what you could change it to. Um, right, let me just see here, is there anything else we should explore? Audio? That would intrigue me, I think, so let's click on that. Okay. I think it needs a bit of context, so I'd put a bit of copy here saying why these are uploaded, who they were, what's going on. Uh, and yeah, I think all your other info is great, I love how much you have on here. Kimberly's biography is okay. I would just say about Kimberly, to be honest, but that's me being nitpicky. It's a bit slow, but that's probably not Kimberly's fault, by the way, everyone. That's probably because we're uploading this video at the same time. Okay, this text is just a bit small, yeah. It does seem to be standardized font. I just double check that all your fonts are the same and I would increase that size. It's a bit too small for web. Standard web size is often a lot larger than you would expect. So it's going to be like a 15 point in a lot of fonts is going to be large enough. Um, take a look at some bigger sites. Take a look at some maybe blogs you read or news sites and see what they're using so that you can get a sense of... Uh, excuse me a sense of the right size and what it looks like because it's going to be different for every font. Um, 
Okay, then we have one more to look at, and this is a little bit of a cheat because <laughs> we've looked at Corey's site already. But Corey was inspired by our web reviews here on the channel to update his site. And I thought it would be fun to look at it again. I know it means Corey getting double the love here on the site, but he's a great member and so I'm happy to <laughs> include him again. And I also think it's a great opportunity for us to learn. So if you guys look back at the previous video with Corey's other review, I think that would be fun to look at. It's a huge step up. Like, I think it looks so fantastic now. Uh, he posted this picture with the with the rainbow jacket and the girl smiling in our group as well. Um, and I just think it's absolutely beautiful seeing him in action and seeing the girl smiling. She had just made a mistake. That's the story behind the photo. So she <laughs> was laughing because she made a mistake and she looked at him up at him laughing, which I think is just such a great sign that that was her first reaction was to laugh and smile at him. Um, yeah, and there's more information and there's some of his Google reviews. So Corey just ran a contest to get Google reviews. And I mean, he got an epic number of Google reviews. It is absolutely fantastic. So he did it, uh, he, I can't remember the exact number, but it was something like, if I get 50 reviews, I'll pick one person to get a $50 gift card. It might've been 40, I can't remember the number, but I think that was the parameters, right? So, and he blew it out of the water. He got above his goal and he, you know, just shot up. He's way above anyone else in terms of the number of reviews on his Google My Business page now, which is just awesome. He just made it happen. He found out that he needed to improve his Google My Business game and he just did it. <laughs> Such a go-getter. It's awesome. I also love that there's all these photos interspersed here of them playing games and having fun and I just think it's looking so good. So the work he put in is awesome. I realise this is a bit of a puff piece but we have also we have already done a, a more critical review of Corey's site and he's just taken it all on board. It's awesome. So yeah, it's all looking fantastic. I'm going to see if I can find something to criticise just as like a bit of a game with ourselves, okay? And then we'll wrap up this review. Um, yeah, I think it looks great. You guys can let me know if you think there's any other improvements he can make. But, I mean, Joanna just said, uh, I love this site. I agree. I think it's awesome. And... Oh, Joanna asked when the other video was, so that was back on the 22nd of July. So if you want to go back and watch the other review, you can see what his site looked like before. But yeah, it's just looking great. That's all I'm going to say. Great, 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 great work, Corey. It's awesome. Keep it up. You're a superstar. That's all I want to say to that. Um, but I thought you guys would enjoy looking back at a site and seeing what can be done. Especially if you have a rainbow jacket. <laughs> Okay, so those were our web reviews for today. I hope you guys enjoyed them. I hope that you're continuing to find those useful. I certainly learn something new every time I look at a new site and, and see something a bit different. I want to let you guys know what is coming up, okay? So, these chats, as I said, are every Monday and they are super fun, so I don't see them stopping anytime soon. If you want to join us live each and every Monday, I recommend you subscribe here on YouTube. I do also send out an email to people as well, but if you're subscribed on YouTube, you get the notification and it can be really handy. So just subscribe to the channel to get that. Um, make sure you like the video, hit the like button, the little thumbs up if you liked the video, obviously, only if you genuinely did, but I'd really appreciate it if you show YouTube that you liked it because that means it knows that it was valuable and that I'm not some silly person talking nonsense. Maybe I am, but if you think that I am, not <laughs> then hit the like button. Um, right, so next week on the show, we're talking about fun! I saved it for last. Of course I did. So we've been doing this series, which is based on the teacher tracker from VMT. And the last of the nine topics is fun, and it's kind of worked out perfectly. It's almost as if I planned it, that that is the last 
when in August, so it's the end of the summer, the official summer here in Ireland. It's the end of the school summer is what I mean. And then it'll be September. So we're going to do fun next week and we're going to take the same broad look at it. What it means to be a fun teacher. Some of the ways you can become more fun and inject more fun into everything you do. The week after that, I have a fun plan. You guys can let me know. <laughs> you guys can let me know what you think of it. What I was thinking I would do the week after that is give you a wee tour of my my studio space and what it looks like. I was going to say now. I'm going to say then. Because there's a chance it might change before then. But I've changed a lot of things around in terms of where I normally teach in person. Um, moved around instrument. Added an extra digital piano. Little signs. Various different things and measures that I'm taking. So I thought I would give you guys a tour of that Monday week one after next because I'll have already been back teaching a week by then and I might give, be able to give you guys some more insight on what's working for me like so if you're thinking about going back to in-person lessons or if you already have or you're just worried about like at some stage I have to do that and there might not be a vaccine by then and what's it gonna what could it look like I'm gonna give you a tour I'm not gonna say this is how you should do it because that's obviously stupid but what I am going to do is say, this is what I'm doing, this is what's working, this is what I'm not sure about, and hopefully it'll provide you with some inspiration. Hopefully it will be useful. So that's the plan. Next week, fun. Tour after that. And if you have any particular topics you want me to talk about in general, you can just let me know, you can just leave a comment here, and I'd love to hear from you. I think that's it for today. Um, if you want access to our online from the outset plans, you just need to become a member of Vibrant Music Teaching. Everything is included in the membership. It is all inclusive. So if you just go to vibrantmusicteaching.com, you will see there, there's a tour video, there's all the information there. You can see what's included, but it's basically everything. That's that's the gist of it. It's all included for one flat membership price. So if you're interested in that, go over and check it out. Hopefully, um, I'll be able to help you with all your online lesson woes at the moment and teaching in general and becoming more creative. So thank you all so much for joining me and I will chat to you, see you next week. Bye for now guys.